Amen. God's good. You could be seated. Thank you so much to the choir, aren't they? They do a great job. I appreciate the choir so much and excited for what the Lord has in store. God's doing a great work in, in our midst, church family. I really can sense that in this season, God is doing more. That was the word we began the year with, that Lord, the Lord had placed a, a burden, a word in my heart, and it was more. And as we kind of pressed into that, all right, Lord, what does that look like? And we talked earlier this year about what does it mean to make room for more of God in our lives, to make room for more of Him. Uh, that more uh, also talks about the idea of your life, that you were made for more. You were made for the more than the life you were living in. This series, as we've been walking through it, God has been meeting us in a very special way. How many of you enjoyed Pastor Willie Alfonso being with us a few weeks ago from the Yankees? It was a uh, a great, uh, a great blessing to hear from him and to sh hear from his life and to see his life. And last week, Pastor Sean Gala, my uh, childhood friend that we grew up together, God uh, made his life for more. It's amazing to see how um, God has worked in his life. I, I got to be honest with you, I sat in that front pew on last Sunday morning, and as he shared God's word, I just wept because I just kept seeing the, the young kid that God saved uh, that I grew up with. And if you could have seen him when I saw him, you might have wept as well to just see how far God has brought him and what God's doing in and through his life. Our God is faithful. Amen. I'm also rejoicing with what God's doing in your lives as we're walking through this series. We're just hearing testimony after testimony. I received an email on Friday from our receptionist with just all these testimonies of what God is doing in this season, prayers that he's answering. How many of you know that our God is a God who answers prayer, that as we seek him, he, he, he is answering? That's why Wednesday nights are so important. I hope that you'll continue to come out. God met us in a special way this past Wednesday night. But as one family in particular was walking through this series, um, things might have looked okay on the outside. How many of us know that when we come to church, we could look fresh on the outside, but that doesn't mean everything's good on the inside. It doesn't mean everything's good just because we look good on Sunday. It doesn't mean Monday through Saturday is, is all great. And um, they, were, they were on a fast pace, uh, on a road towards divorce. Uh, they felt like their marriage was just in trial and it was unraveling and there were challenges happening. But they started to come in. They were leaning in during this series in particular. And the Lord began to meet each one of them and minister to them. And they realized that their marriage was made for more than divorce. And God has uh, mended that relationship. And God has been building them stronger and stronger. And they really have seen the hand of God over their relationship. Aren't you so thankful for his goodness that he meets us? I really believe God has a special word for us each time we gather together. And in this series in particular, I think God's going to do more than we could ever imagine as we walk together. Well, we're, we're getting close to Easter. This series is bringing us right towards Easter Sunday. It's two weeks away, as Mandy shared, and uh, we're making room for more people than we could have ever imagined. God has been growing us in this season, and we give him all the glory for it, and we want to make sure we have room for everyone that's going to be with us this Easter Sunday. So I want to encourage you to continue to ask that question, who am I bringing to Easter at Evangel? Who is close to me but far from Jesus? Who needs to uh, be extended that invitation from me? That one invitation has the power to change someone's life for eternity. I tell you that, church. I'm the byproduct of it. So many of the people in my life are as well, and I hope you'll be doing everything you can to bring someone this Easter and to help us make room for more. Again, remember those four service times at 7.30, 9, 11, and 1, and if you're a part of the Evangel family and you can come to one of those early or late services, come at 7.30, come at 1 o'clock p.m., uh, make room for more. We're just excited because we're believing God is going to change many lives in just two weeks, and we want you to be a part of it. So so uh, we're looking forward to all that God's going to do in the midst of that. Today I want to talk to you as we continue on in this series. I want to talk to you about uh, a special principle that I really believe is going to unlock something in your life and in my life as we walk through this idea of what does it mean to be made for more. And I believe that if we can get this principle in our hearts and lives, it's going to change our perspective. It's going to help us as we walk forward from this place. And um, I really believe it's going to bring about more than you can imagine in a very practical way, as you continue to live for God. Right, here's the principle I want you to know today from God's Word. That there is more that God wants to do in you to prepare you for what He's going to do through you. There is more He needs to do in you to get you ready for the more He is going to do through you. 
Oftentimes, we're excited about what God might do through our lives. Sometimes we can get pretty excited to say, oh, yes, I've been made for more, and I want to do this, and I want to do that, and I want to be like Pastor Willie or Pastor Sean or whoever else, and I'm gonna, I want to go on to do these great things. And God, I want you to work through my lives. But can I tell you that the Lord comes close to you today, and here's what he's going to tell you and teach you through his word. It's this, that before I can do more through you, I have to do more in you. Before I'm going to work powerfully through you, I need to work powerfully within you. And there's a few ways that that needs to happen. And some of us, we got to get ready. Tell your neighbor, get ready. Get ready, because if we truly want to be used by God, then he's got to do more in us. And he's going to do that. So, Lord, I pray that you'd come right now, Lord, through the power of your word and by the power of your Holy Spirit and speak to our hearts. And, Lord, we pray for more today, Lord God. Do more in us so that you might do more through us. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you open your Bibles with me to Luke chapter 5, we're going to explore the life of one of the followers of Jesus whose life was turned upside down one day when he accepted an invitation for Jesus to get into his boat. I promise you this, if you invite Jesus into your boat with you, it might change everything. If you invite him into your space and you follow his instructions and you begin to obey what he calls you to do, you will see a life marked by more, marked by the miraculous. You will begin to see more happening than you could have ever imagined. It's an amazing adventure following God. We get a front row seat to that, and we're going to explore the life of a man named Simon whose name was changed to Peter because Jesus changed his very identity because he saw more than Simon could ever see. As we look here, we're going to start in Luke chapter 5, starting in verse 1. It says this, that one day, as Jesus was preaching on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, great crowds pressed in on him to listen to the word of God. And he noticed two empty boats on the water's edge, for the fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. Stepping into one of the boats, Jesus asked Simon, its owner, to push out into the water. So he sat in the boat and he taught the crowds from there. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Now go out where it is deeper and let down your nets to catch some fish. I love this, that Jesus invites him into the deep. I want to tell you something today, that I really believe that God is desiring to bring you deeper than you've ever been before. And if you want to experience the more that he has for you, it will only come in the deeper waters that you allow him to bring you to. And so he says, are you willing to go out a little further? Are you willing to push out a little bit further from the shore? Can I tell you that whenever you're in a boat, and I've been in a boat, I actually, in our last series, one of our values uh, here at Evangel is we row together, and our uh, creative team thought it would be really fun to put Pastor Chris in a boat and put me out in the middle of a lake to film, uh, to film a video about the power of rowing together. The problem was there was no one else in the boat with me, so it didn't, I don't think, illustrate it as well as it could have. Uh, but can I tell you, every inch I took out from the shore was more and more scary. I had, I had a, a microphone on, a wireless microphone pack. I had my phone on me. I had my wallet, my keys. I had everything. And I only had one take. I said, if I fall in the water, then we're not filming this thing because we're not going to have any other chance. Can I tell you, every foot I went out into the water, I was more and more vulnerable because it required more and more of me to just be kind of still. I felt like any movement I made, I could capsize. But isn't it the same in life that where God wants to take you is going to require a vulnerability in you, a a, a level of surrender, a level of trust that he has you? Because I'm telling you what, I wasn't going to put my feet down and stop myself. If I was in, I was in. That was it. And, And that's often what Jesus calls us to whenever he wants to take you to the place of more in your life. He says, I want to do more through you or more in you, but I need you to be willing to move out of your comfort zone, out into the deep. Some of us were unwilling to cross that threshold of more because it's, it's our, it's, we're holding ourselves back. We, we want to be tethered to the shore, tethered to security, tethered to our job, tethered to whatever it might be. But he says, push out into the deep and see what I'm about to do. Let's go catch some fish. Let's go catch more. And I, and I love the response because it's our response. Master, in verse 5, Simon Peter replied, we worked hard all last night and we didn't catch a thing. We worked so hard all last night, all last season. We didn't catch anything. Do you want to know what's amazing about following God? Sometimes the Lord will put it in your heart to go and do something you already did that was unfruitful, that was unsuccessful. 
And, and you can easily say, I'm never going back there again. I'm never doing that. I'm never serving there again. I'm never doing that thing because last time it was a mess. Because last time it all fell apart. Because last time, da 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 But here, here, here's what I want you to know. you got to figure out who's the one asking you to do it. Because in, in and of our own strength, and, and I found this, that sometimes my returns can be so diminished when I'm just doing it in my own strength when I'm trying and trying and trying and I know it's the right thing to do or what I want to do or what I should do and I'm working at that goal or working at whatever. And here's what I've learned. I've learned the difference of working in my own strength or working under the grace of God. And I promise you this, that if I'm doing what I'm doing in and of my own strength for myself, it's going gonna, it's gonna to wear me out and it's gonna, it sometimes won't, we, I won't see much. But I found this, that if, I, if God has called me to it and God has put it before me and put it in me to do that, I can do the same exact thing I did before, but if God's hand is on it, man, he sustains me, he strengthens me, and he multiplies the fruit of it. Does that make sense? So this is something so important to realize, because I think for many of us, we just go by, our, well, I already tried that, I already did that, I already said, you know, but I, I, and, and, and he said that, he said, we were out all night, we didn't catch anything, Jesus, you're telling us to, but I love, I love this response. Worked hard all night last night and didn't catch a thing, but if you say so, I'll let the nets down again. Oh, man, I just, if there's nothing else, if you can maybe even tune out for the rest of the message if you want to. I think there's going to be some good stuff coming, but, uh, but I'm telling you, if you just get this one thing today and you leave with it, we're good. If you can get it into your heart, those words to the Lord, but if you say so. Whatever it is that you're asking me to do, whatever it is I might be doubting you about, whatever it is that I may think won't work, or whatever, but if you say so, God, then I'm going to do it. If you say so, Jesus, if you can learn what it means to be obedient to the voice of God in your life, I promise you will unlock more than you could ever imagine. So Jesus says, I want you to go out. I want you to do the exact thing you just did that was completely unsuccessful, and I'm so thankful that his answer was, but if you say so, then I'm going to go let the nets down again. But if you say so, I'm going back to that place. But if you say so, I'll go there again. I'll do that again, Lord. Whatever it is that you're calling me to. In this time, their nets were so full of fish, they began to tear. And a shout for help brought their partners in the other boat. And soon both boats were so full of fish and on the verge of sinking. When Simon Peter realized what had happened... You see, this thing wasn't about boats and fish at all. That's what I love about it for Simon. Because for him... If he didn't, he doesn't work like you and I work. Some of us, you, you make a salary per year. Some of you, every two weeks, you're going to get a paycheck. You know how they got paychecks back then? Based on how many fish they brought in. They said they didn't catch anything that night. You know what that meant? They put in a lot of work, and they got nothing to bring home to their families. And, and now, because of what just happened, they have more than they could ever imagine. Someone say more. More. They have more. But here's what I love. Simon Peter's not focused on the fish. He's focused on the source. Oh, man, how quickly when God blesses do we just keep focused on the blessing and we don't turn our eyes back to him again. Simon does. He realized what had happened. He realized what Jesus was doing. He realized whose midst he was in. And he said, Lord, please leave me. I'm such a sinful person. For he was awestruck by the number of fish they had caught, as were the others with him. And his partners, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, they were also amazed. And here's what Jesus says to Simon. Don't be afraid. From now on, you will be fishing for people. And as soon as they landed, they left everything and followed Jesus. You know what I love is that they had nothing. Jesus got into their boat and said, come on, let's go out into the deep and let's get more. They get more, more than they've ever seen, more than they've ever caught, more than they could ever imagine. And then Jesus looks at the more and he says, there's more, more. There's more than this. You're going to fish for people. And they left the best catch they've ever had and said, no, no, no. That's nothing compared to what Jesus has just invited us into. There's more. And they began to run after it. And that's the beginning of this guy's life story, his journey. And Jesus looked at him and said, you're going to be fishing for people. I have more for you than you ever could imagine. And they went on this amazing journey. And the first thing that Jesus is teaching Simon Peter is he's teaching him what it means to rely on him, or rely on him as the source, rely on his calling, his plans for his life. And, and Jesus saw incredible potential in Simon. And he invited him into a journey. And, and through this journey, 
Simon would begin to learn so many different things about himself and about the Lord. But here's the principle, remember? Before he can do more through you, he's got to do more in you. Because there were also some negative things about Simon Peter. He was impulsive. He didn't necessarily keep his word, which we'll get to in a little while. There were rough edges, just like there are in so many of us. And here's what I, I'd love for you to grasp today, is that some of us, we feel so unqualified to fulfill a calling from God. But can I promise you this, that he was just like you. He's flesh and blood, man. He messed up. He missed it. We, we have this way of just making these biblical characters to be superhuman, special, perfect people. I promise you, they weren't. They were just like you and me. They were flesh and blood. And as he walked and as he did these things, he failed. He messed up. He missed it. He lacked faith when he needed it. But Jesus looked into his life and said, more. I have more for you if you follow me. And I promise you, he tells you the same exact thing today. He says, I have more for you. And you may feel so unqualified, but if I've called you, I promise you, I will give you everything you need if you just follow me. And so he began to teach him lessons. And, and as they continued on their journey, we find out in, in Matthew's gospel later on that, that Peter would meet Jesus out on those waters again. And he said, hey, I'm going to teach you a lesson out in the deep. Not only am I going to ask you to push your boat out into the deep, in the middle of a storm, I'm going to have you step out into the waters in the middle of the deep. Learn what faith really looks like. Keeping your eyes on me and obeying my voice and watch where I'll take you. So Peter's learning these lessons because Jesus has to do more in him before he's going to do more through him. We get to chapter 16, and they go up to this region uh, in northern Israel called Caesarea Philippi, and it's a place where they worshipped all these other gods, all these pagan gods, and there's all these different places. In fact, there's a temple to a god named Pan there where they would do uh, treacherous things, terrible things. They would even sacrifice children in this place, and they believed that it was appeasing these gods. And Jesus stood there with all his disciples around him. And the Bible says in Matthew 16, Starting in verse 13, it says he came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, and he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? So he's like, what are people saying? And they replied, well, some think you're John the Baptist, or some say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But then Jesus asked them, who do you say that I am? At the end of your life, it won't matter what everyone else says about Jesus, it's going to matter what you believe about him. And he said, what about you? What do you think? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. He said, you're the one God promised, Jesus. This is it. I'm convinced. You are him. And here's what Jesus says back. Blessed are you, Simon, son of John, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. You do not learn this from any human being. Now I say to you, he says, you know who I am? Now I'm going to let you know who you really are. I want you to, I want to promise you this. You can't fully understand who you are until you understand who he is. It's just, that's just the way it's going to be. And he says, now let me, know who, let me let you know who you are. He says, now you are Simon, but now you are Peter, which means rock. He says, I'm changing your very identity. No longer are you impulsive, going by the waves. You are going to be a rock. You're going to be a foundational piece. And he says this, and on this rock... I will build my church and the gates of hell will not conquer it. <laughs> I mean, did you catch that? What he just says to Peter, he says, you were Simon, you are now Peter. And on this rock, you're Petros, you're a rock. And on this rock, I'm going to build my church. I'm going to do more through you than you can ever imagine. I'm going to use you to build the church. And he says that you're going to become that. But again, can I tell you? That whenever you're going to build anything of significance, anything of value, the quality of the materials that you choose are paramount in any kind of venture you're going to build. Can I tell you the painstaking labor people would go through in this day and time to ensure that they have the right stones for the project? Can I tell you the stones that they would fret over the most? The foundational stones. Because the foundational stones needed to be able to bear the weight of everything that would rest on them. Are you following me? And so you'd have that, and you'd say, these stones. And so it talks about the idea that builders would reject stones all the time. They would look at it, and they would say, this stone is flawed. This stone is, does not have the integrity or the quality that's needed. It will crush under pressure. It will, it will become undone. It will, it will crack. This one has cracks in it. There are already stress fractures in it. No, nope, we got to reject this one. And so there'd be this process of selecting the right stones. Jesus says to Peter, 
You are a rock, and on this rock I'm going to build the church. But (laughs) just like you and me, Peter was pretty flawed. So I have to stand back in this moment, and I have to tell you, just from reading the scriptures, you can see it as well. There are a lot of cracks. There are a lot of vulnerabilities. There are a lot of some integrity issues to this rock that he's choosing to build with. And for me, if I'm making that decision, knowing what I know that he's about to do, I'm thinking, I don't think this is the best one to use to build because he's about to reject Jesus. He's about to lose his temper. He's about, he's about to do a lot of things. And I think that in the world and in the, way, in the eyes of people, we can miss it. In the eyes of ourselves, when you look in the mirror, you'd say, I don't think I have what it takes. Can I tell you that Jesus sees more in you than you can even see in yourself? He sees more in you than others see in you. Anyone that's looking at Peter must be thinking, oh my goodness, now this guy, he says everything, but he doesn't. You're like Whatever they're saying about him, hot-tempered, he, he literally cut a guy's ear off, church family. He says, on this rock, I'm going to build my church. You know why? Because Jesus saw more. He saw the potential. He saw the power of what was going to happen through Peter's life. And he began to say that. But here's what I want you to know. For him to become the rock that Jesus was going to use to build, he had to do more in him. Jesus understood what it would take, and he was ready to bring him on a journey. You fast forward years later in Peter's life and in his journey, and here's what you'll find. That Peter, towards the end of his life, he wrote two letters to the church. He wrote two letters that were circulated and sent to different churches after he had been a follower of Jesus. He became an apostle. He saw Jesus raised from the dead. All these amazing things happened. At the end of his life, towards the end, he begins to speak with perspective. And here's what he says to this group of believers. He said, there's more God has to do in you before he's going to work through you. Peter understood this principle because he experienced it for himself. For him to become Peter the rock, Jesus had to do more. And I want you to know God works through the good times and he works through the difficult times. In fact, I feel like I grow more through the challenges than through the joys. Are you with me? Come on, sometimes it's through the most difficult seasons that God's doing the deepest work in us. So Peter writes to this group of believers and listen to these words in light of everything we've been talking about. Starting in verse 6, here's what he says. Be truly glad. There is a wonderful joy ahead Even though you must endure many trials for a little while, these trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold, though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through the many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the entire world. Peter says this, there's joy waiting for you. There's more waiting for you, but it's on the other side of some trials and challenges. But Peter knows this, those trials don't have to break you, they can make you better. Those challenges can be redeemed by God, and he can use them to do more in you so he can do more through you. He says the fires that burn that I know can hurt you in this life can also be used in the right hands, in God's hands, to purify you, to refine you. You know, it talks about the idea that it burns away to prove the genuineness of your faith. And oftentimes when we read things like that in the Bible, that's what it says in your translation, or that it's being tested. It's being tested through fire. Here's what I want you to know. It's not like the testing that we can think and the proving that we think. Oftentimes, someone will say, hey, I love you. Say, prove it. How I do it? Prove it. Meaning, like, I don't believe you, so I need you to prove it and show me that you can do what you say you can do. That's not what we're talking about here in the Bible. I want you to know this idea of proving or testing. It isn't that God's sitting up in heaven, not sure whether or not you really love him, not sure whether your faith is really strong, and therefore he's going to test you, saying, I don't believe it, but why don't you show me, and then I'll, then I'll decide. It doesn't work that way. Do you want to know what this testing is like? It's like this. God says, just like a proving or a testing of metal, that whenever we apply fire to it, what it does is it burns away the impurities because he knows there's something good inside of there. He knows there's more. And what he'll do is there'll be a fire and intensity that comes. And just like someone that's trying to, trying to smelt metal together, precious metals, they allow the fire to burn, and it raises all the impurities to the surface. And then he just skims the impurities out. And he says, all that this has been doing is testing and proving the genuineness of your faith. 
The Lord looks and doesn't say, I'm not sure. He says, I know. And therefore, to bring out more, i got to do more in you. It's going to get hot, but it's bringing out more. Do you get it? Are you with me? And so trials and difficulties can bring about more. And although we can hate what it feels like, I promise you God can redeem every bit of it, every challenge, every obstacle. There's a great illustration of this that I I came across a few weeks ago. A team from our church of our pastors and leaders, we went down to Dallas, Texas. And while we were down there for a conference, it was a conference on church multiplication. And if you know anything about us, our heart is to see changed lives, changing communities here, across the street, and around the world. We want to see it happening everywhere, in our nation, uh, in our backyard, and to the ends of the earth. And so we want to see neighborhoods and communities transformed. And we believe the best way to do that is to see life-giving churches happening. So we have churches that we partnered with around the world. We have church plants that we're partnering with around the country. And we have the work we're doing in these very communities around New Jersey and churches that we're coming alongside of. And so our heart is for those that are planting churches. And while we were at this conference, it was a big conference on church planting and a video played in the middle of the first night. And I got introduced to a pastor named Stephen and his wife Priscilla. And they felt God call them to plant a church in New York City and leave Texas and leave everything behind that they'd ever known. And a couple years ago, they planted a church called the Grace Place. And the journey God brought them through is exactly what we're talking about today. Before God could do more through Stephen and his wife, he had to do some more in them. And he was going to use and even redeem some deep challenges that they were about to go through so that his glory could be even more fully displayed. So I want you to take a look at this video because I think it so powerfully tells the story of what we've been talking about this morning. Uh, Spiritual warfare is a major part of church planting. And when you go into the front lines, the enemy does not like that. We had a great life. We had a really great home. God does what he does and he disrupted that comfortable life. So we were sitting in this missions conference and the church planter was sharing his story and how he started from scratch. And and Priscilla leaned over to me and she whispered in my ear, doesn't that make you want to plant a church? My initial reaction was absolutely not. But when you say that, what God usually does is he puts that very thing that you say you'll never do on your heart. That desire to plant a church just got stronger and stronger. The first city that came up was New York City and so really felt like uh, we were supposed to plant this church from scratch. We talked about the different places. New York City was just a no-brainer. And we are so blessed to be able to have had gone through the CMN training before we launched the church. It helped us so much. Around the same time that we made the decision that we were going to move to New York City, I was diagnosed with testicular cancer. It kind of rattled our decision. I remember having conversations with Steven and him just feeling like maybe we should wait a little bit longer. I just remember just speaking out like cancer just does not get to decide the timeline of God's call on our lives. I didn't have to undergo chemotherapy treatment. I ended up getting the surgery. It was successful. Three or four weeks before we were scheduled to move to New York City, I finally got the green light. Even from the finances, we didn't have enough. And we just were like, okay, God, we're like packing our boxes. Like, okay. (laughs) The Sunday before we moved, we had raised all of our finances. So we embarked on the craziest journey of our lives. And we moved from a 1,600 square foot house into like a 500 square foot apartment, walking up five flights of stairs with groceries, with laundry. But you find your way around the uncomfortability when God's dream is just big and you can feel it. We were really excited about the launch of our church. All of our resources, all of our energy, all of our effort was going towards this launch service. I was driving somewhere in my car and I get a phone call from my doctor and he said, Steve, I've got bad news for you. We found cancer in one of your lymph nodes and I believe that you're gonna have to undergo chemotherapy treatment. That was like a punch to the gut. I don't think I've ever been more disappointed in God than I was in that moment. Like you sent us here, you called us here. God, what are you doing? This is really hard and um, scary. And so, you know, we walked to a coffee shop on the Upper East Side and there was a bench sitting out there. And then I just leaned over to Stephen and I was like, let's just worship God here and now. We worship, we prayed and we cried. Something really cool happened while we worship. We just really felt that that heaviness just yeah. broke off of us. Yeah. We decided that cancer was not going to dictate or mm-hmm. determine right. the timeline of God's call in our lives. And so we're gonna launch the church even though I'm undergoing chemotherapy. 
We launched our church with 82 people and in New York City, that's actually really good. But the very next week, we only had 13 people at church and I wasn't even there because I was in the hospital uh, because of complications. It was just a roller coaster. I was so sick. I was hospitalized. My entire body was shutting down and I was accruing hospital bills. I gave every ounce of strength in my body to drag myself and preach, and we would get to church and there would be like 10 people. And just it being anointed, it was just crazy to watch how God um, filled in the gaps because it just, I didn't think that it would be possible. There were many times where I was like, God, this is the dream that you intended for us to have. And so I had to come to that place where I realized it's about, am I being obedient to what God has spoken to me? That is what got me through during that season. You know, God doesn't call us to be successful. He calls us to be faithful. It, you know, church planting is all about who is willing to get up once you get knocked down. Prayer worked, I am cancer free. Yeah. Me going through cancer has really taken my ministry to the next level because I am able to identify with people's pain. Whether you're killing it in your church planting process or you're about to quit, I just wanna encourage you to keep moving forward to keep being faithful to what God has called you to do. Our entire baseline is just obedience and obeying God and in in, in what he's called us to do. You're gonna get knocked down. There's gonna be obstacles. There's gonna be things that come your way, but God is faithful. And if you'll get back up, he'll continue to use you. Amen. <clears throat> come on up, Pastor Rick. Um, God is so faithful, amen. And he invites us to be faithful as well. You know, when I watched that video with our team, we were all completely broken by what we saw, overwhelmed by what we're talking about even today, how God honors that faithfulness and how he brings about a greater anointing, just as Priscilla said, even through the adversity and the trials. But I was hit with a couple simultaneous things. The second one was I deeply felt in my heart troubled for this church and just for like they went through that, they left Texas and they packed up their lives and they moved to New York City. And so I went to the leadership of Church Multiplication Network who helped launch them. And I said, what church is near them? Who's pouring into them? Who's connected to them? And they said, they really don't have anyone. They're kind of on their own up there in New York City. I said, I don't want it to be the case. I said, we're right, we're right down the block. We're right here in New Jersey. I said, we want to connect with them. We want to share life with them. We want to encourage them and bring them in. And so, uh, church family, I'm excited to tell you that this Wednesday night, Pastor Stephen and his wife Priscilla are going to be here with us live in the prayer meeting with their, with their two precious children. And um, we're just beginning a relationship with them. We don't want anyone to have to walk alone, and we believe God has an incredible calling on what God's doing there. And so as a church, we're just going to kind of bless them and support them and encourage them along the way. I hope you'll come out on Wednesday night. I want to pray a prayer of blessing over them. We also, we normally receive an offering on Wednesday night. I want the entire offering to be able to go towards them to bless the grace place and what God's put in their hearts. So come, come with a full heart. Come ready to just um, encourage them along the way, and I know that you'll be blessed as well. God's doing more. Amen. Amen. I'm excited about it. And to see the, the idea of, of the challenges, right? But the challenges are what can bring about an anointing. And, and, and that's what Priscilla said. She said, yes, there was chemotherapy. Yes, there were all these challenges. But there was an anointing God was bringing about through it all because he wanted to do more through him. And he was going to allow more to happen in him. No, it wasn't that God was bringing all these bad things into his life. But here's what I know. Our God is our redeemer. What that means is that he takes what the enemy means for evil and he turns it to good. The enemy says, I'm going to do this. I'll use this cancer or this challenge or this storm. It will snuff him out. And the Lord says, no, I'm going to take it. I'm going to make it a platform for even more glory. I'm going to make it, I'm going to make it something different than you could ever imagine. God can sometimes bring us from our lowest moments and points to make more out of us. You know, I think about that in Peter's life. Simon Peter, on the night Jesus was betrayed. When we think about Jesus being betrayed, who betrayed Jesus? The answer that we'll all say is Judas betrayed Jesus. Who else betrayed Jesus? Simon Peter. Do you know that on the night Jesus was arrested and taken in, that very night, earlier that evening, Jesus says, one of you are going to betray me. And Peter's like, I'll never betray you. I would never do that. Some of you have friends like that, right? And then when the going gets tough, they're gone. You don't know where they went. He said, I'll never do it. Jesus said, I promise you this. Before the rooster crows, you're going to disown me three times, Peter. No, I'll never do that. Well, don't you know if Jesus gets arrested, they're standing outside the, the, the gate, and he's in there. He walks in, and people start stopping Peter. Hey, aren't you one of Jesus' disciples? No, I'm not. Number one. 
They, he's over there warming his hands by the fire. Aren't you one of his followers? No, I promise you I'm not. Then a relative, someone connected to someone who Peter cut the ear off of in the garden when Jesus is being arrested, says, no, no, you're definitely one of his disciples. Weren't you there in the olive grove? He says, I promise you I'm not one of his disciples. And then the rooster crows. Three times he disowns Jesus. He's done with him. Could you imagine how low of a point that would have felt? He did the very thing Jesus said he would do. Talk about a rock that you're going to build with. There's some serious flaws. But here's what I love. That after Jesus rises from the dead, after he goes to the cross, is now alive, and he goes back to his disciples, he sits down for breakfast in John chapter 21, and he begins to speak to Peter, and he has three questions for him. Because Peter answered three questions wrong. Some of you, you feel like you've been in that place. I have disappointed God. I can no longer be used by him because I messed up too bad. I promise you, if you keep believing that, you're buying into the enemy's scheme for your life. I promise you this, that God is willing to restore you and do something amazing through you if you're willing to turn towards him. And so here's what the Lord does. He shows up to Peter, and he begins to ask him this question. You can read about it in John chapter 21. Verses 15 through 17 at breakfast, he says, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Simon's like, yeah. Peter says, yes, I love you, Lord. He says, and feed my sheep. And he says again, do you love me more than these? And he says, of course, I love you. And he says, okay, feed, feed my lambs. And then finally, a third time, Jesus asks him. And the Bible says that Peter becomes offended. He becomes sad. He becomes hurt by it. And he says, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. He said, feed my sheep. You know what Jesus was doing? He was restoring Peter. He was going to the, do you really love me? Are you ready? Are you ready to be used by me? And Peter says, yes, I love you, Lord. And in that moment of just surrender and in that moment, the Lord begins to turn everything around for Peter. Here's what I want you to do. Jesus has the power to redeem every part of your story. You may think there are parts that, no, that's too broken. That's too backwards. Come on. Come on. Who have you been listening to over the last few weeks? God can take anything and use it if you're willing to surrender it to him. But before he can do more through you, he has to do more in you. And that happens through the power of his forgiveness. That happens through the power of his restoration in your life. That comes through the power of your obedience to follow him where he calls you to go. But here's what else. It comes through the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. Because Peter, this is who he was. But in a moment, in Acts chapter 2, we come to see that on the day of Pentecost, after Jesus ascended to heaven, he's now in heaven, Peter is with the disciples, and they're in an upper room, and they're praying. And the Bible says the Holy Spirit fell in power. The place where they were at, there just began to be a loud sound like a rushing wind. The Holy Spirit descended. It was like tongues of fire that rested on them. They began to speak in another language as the Holy Spirit gave them the ability to. And as they spoke out, all the people around them heard them, and they thought, wow, there's a bunch of people that have been drinking too much up in this upper room up there. They're partying a little bit too loud for us. And what does the Bible say? It says in Acts chapter 2, 14, Peter stepped forward and he says, listen carefully, all of you. No, make no mistake about this. These people aren't drunk. He then begins to preach to them. Thousands of people, he's just preaching. He's sharing about who Jesus is. Where was the guy who denied Jesus three times? Weeks ago. I want you to know the Holy Spirit has the power to change you from who you are to who God has called you to be. And without that, without that, it doesn't happen. And he says this, let everyone know for certain that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Verse 37 says, Peter's words pierce their hearts. And they said, what should we do? And he said, repent of your sins, turn to Jesus, be baptized, and then you're going to receive the Holy Spirit. And he continued to preach and he said, turn and be saved. And the Bible then says, those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day, 3,000 in all. Come on, go all the way back to the first moment whenever he called him in Luke chapter 5. He said more. He said, you think it's impressive that your boats are overflowing with fish? You're going to fish for people. 3,000 added to their number that one day through his life. And this is the day the church was born. I want you to know Jesus looks at your life and he sees more. He declares more than you could ever imagine. I told you about Acts 3. Peter walks by and a man's healed that's sitting by the gate. 
and then he gets arrested for it. The man gets healed, and the same people that look to arrest Jesus and crucify him, they now arrest Peter and John, and they begin to question him. Where is the guy who denies Jesus? Here's another test. Are you one of his followers? Absolutely I am. It changed him. There's a boldness in Peter now that wasn't there before. Peter, verse 8, filled with the Holy Spirit. It makes a difference. He makes all the difference in the world. He says, rulers and elders of our people, are we being questioned today because we've done a good deed for a crippled man? Do you want to know how he was healed? Let me clearly state to all of you and all the people of Israel that he was healed by the powerful name of Jesus Christ, the man whom you crucified, but whom God has raised from the dead. He said, this is what's happened. And Peter's just preaching the gospel. He's sharing. He's not timid anymore. He was made for more. And then they said, okay, that's fine. You can leave, but don't keep talking about this Jesus. Just please be quiet. And here's what they say back in verse 19. Peter and John replied, do you think God wants us to obey you rather than him? We cannot stop telling about everything we've seen and heard. My friends, the same thing happens in our lives. If you really want to experience the more that God has for you, you got to allow God to do more in you. Come on, would you stand to your feet this morning? Would you stand to your feet? And I just want to invite you this morning to say yes to the Lord. Some of you, he's calling to that deeper place. Remember he said, come out to, uh, to the deep? Some of you, he's calling to the deeper places. He's inviting you to step out of your comfort zone. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to invite you, if that's you, to just step out of your seat and come down to this altar. We're just going to pray for a few moments. If you believe that God's marked your life for more and maybe you've been hesitant, maybe you've been holding back, whatever it looks like, just step out and just step into what God has for you. This altar is going to be like the waters of the deep, just saying, Lord, yes, I'm coming, Lord God. I'm stepping out into whatever it is that you have for me. So just step out of your seats and come down here to this place. Some of you, you feel like you've disappointed God. You feel like he's disappointed with you, that you've let him down, that you've rejected him, whatever it is, and you're just coming back. You're saying, Lord, I love you more than these. I'm, I'm willing. I want to be used by you now, Lord God. I'm stepping out, and I'm just stepping into what you have for me. And for some of you, he's ready to to restore you today in his presence. He wants to restore into you the calling he has over your life. I'm going to invite some of you to come today that you are on the other side, like you're just at the edge of being touched by God and it's going to change everything, but it's on the other side of you having a genuine life-changing encounter with the Holy Spirit. Some of you today, you need that moment. You need a Pentecost moment in your life to say, Lord, I know who I am, but I, I want to be who you've made me to be, and I'm just going to believe that God's going to fill you with his Holy Spirit today. He's the one who has the power to do that. So today, if you've never been filled with the Holy Spirit in the way that we read about in the book of Acts chapter 2, that happened for me, uh, and that's happened for so many here in this church, and you say, I want more, Lord God. I I want to have that boldness. I want to have that, that courageous heart, Lord God, to just be able to share about you. And Lord, I want more of your spirit, your, your presence in my life. So that's you. Just you come as well. If you're in the balcony, don't let that keep you from experiencing what God has for you this morning. Come on. We're just going to just worship the Lord for just a few moments. Come on. Just begin to just press into him. Just begin to ask him right now to fill you, to lead your life. Come on. This is a moment. We're not going to sing anything for these few moments because church family, I need you to be praying right now. Every person from the front to the back, would you just lift your hands right now before the Lord and just say, Lord, come and have your way with me, Lord God. Lord, where you lead me, I will follow. Today, if your heart is surrendered before the Lord, would you just invite him to meet you and to use you, to bring you to the deeper places, to speak a word into your life, to transform you from the inside out, to restore you and redeem your story, to fill you with his spirit and his power. Come on, he can meet you right now in this moment, wherever you are. Just begin to call out to him right now. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Come on, church family. Just begin to raise your voice to the Lord right now. This is for you. Just begin to press into him for these moments right now. Come on, would you just begin to now worship the Lord? Just begin to praise Jesus right now. Come on, we're going to begin to sing out a chorus right now. I want you just to enter in and sing this from the depths of your heart right now. Come on, make this your prayer today.
just want more. Oh, I just want more. More of you, God. More of you, God. I just want. spirit would just fall upon your people that lord god you would come lord i thank you that your that your presence is here lord god that you're restoring sons and daughters today lord god you're reaffirming them there's some lord today lord god they've been marked with a name with a label that the, they've been told their entire life this is who you are and today lord god in your presence you're changing everything lord god you're giving them a new name you're giving them a new identity lord god you're giving them a new calling lord god we thank you today lord god that, Lord, they're marked by you. They're marked for more, Lord God. So we thank you today, Lord God, as we follow you, Lord God. You're leading and you're guiding us. Lord, I thank you today for some, Lord God. They thought that they failed you. They thought it was over in today, Lord God. Oh, your sweet presence draws them afresh and anew, Lord God, saying, I still got more for you. And, Lord, I thank you today. They're going to walk out with a, with a grace and with a forgiveness, Lord God, and with a joy that's going to fill their hearts, Lord God. Oh, Jesus, I thank you, Lord. I, I just pray there's someone here. You've been, when you walk into church, you feel so much guilt. You just like, you walk in, there's like a, like, oh, like it just makes you feel uncomfortable. I just believe the Lord's releasing you of that because he's ready to let you walk in and out. And there's going to be a joy in his presence because he's leading you. He's guiding you. He's, he's, he's walking with you. Oh, Lord, thank you for your presence. Thank you for your spirit falling, Lord. We just ask you, Holy Spirit, to come and just fill your people afresh and anew. I pray you'd fill them with power, with strength, with boldness, Lord. We pray for these next few weeks especially, Lord. Oh, Lord, as we are going to celebrate in two weeks the power of your resurrection, Lord God, we pray for countless lives to be added to your number. We pray for many, Lord God, to receive you as Lord and Savior. And I pray it would be through the lives of some today that have responded, Lord. You've marked them for more. And I pray, Lord God, that there be others that be brought to you through that. So, Lord, we just commit each one to you today. Day, Lord God, we commission them to walk and to experience the more that you've made them for. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen, and amen, amen. Praise God. Amen. You don't have to rush out today. If you need prayer, our prayer team's going to be available. If you want to continue to worship God, feel free to stay up here. If not, please feel free to save your conversations for the foyer, and we'll see you on Wednesday night at our prayer meeting with Pastor Stephen and Priscilla.